All right, ladies and gentlemen, unit seven, part one, no need for any kind of hubbub, let's go. We start the unit with this general idea that rulers who are in charge during this period are going to try and use realism. That is to say, in order to stay in charge, in order to get ahead, you're going to have to understand the way other people are going to think, other countries are going to react, and you're going to use that as your compass in how you make decisions. So for instance, we start off with Louis Napoleon III, who is the nephew of the great Napoleon Bonaparte. Now, Louis Napoleon III understands that what really removes French leaders over time is an unwillingness to change. So, really what you get with Louis Napoleon III is a movement towards liberalism. He's going to allow workers to go on strike, workers to make unions. He's going to allow people who might disagree with him to voice that disagreement. Now, let's not mix things up. He's still an emperor. He really isn't going to change anything he doesn't want to change, but he at least gives people the idea that he's willing to talk, and in doing so creates a situation that's going to encourage people to keep him in power longer. He is also responsible for the reconstruction of Paris under Baron Haussmann, the overhaul of the city in order to create a more modern city, that is to say big broad streets, sewer systems, street lights, somewhere that wealthy middle class people are going to think, I'll live there, that seems safe, it seems fun, they have department stores, they have parks, they have cool things going on, right? It's like Bakersfield except with a whole bunch of cool things in it. Yeah, just like that. Okay. The biggest moment of the foreign policy of our man Louis is the Crimean War which really begins out of Russian expansion. The Russians are a landlocked icebox, and trying to get out of that icebox has been a Russian ambition for centuries. The Russians believe that if they can get some warm water ports, then they're going to be able to move towards being a world power. How to do that? Well, one of the ways is to expand into the territories of the rapidly declining Ottoman Empire. The two countries that are going to band together in order to stop that or the British and the French, who see Russian expansion during this period as being a threat to them. And rightly so, they have the largest imperial empires. So when the Russians begin to think about expanding, it's Britain and France who, for balance of power reasons, have to rise to stop this expansion. Keep in mind, there's no real territory to be had here for the British and the French. When the dust settles, they're not going to take the land. They're not going to take anything from the Russians. They have no land that borders the territory they're fighting in. They're here to stop the expansion of a Russian empire, and by fighting here, they can assure themselves an opportunity to stop Russia from becoming a large naval power. Now, some of the big consequences. Number one, the Austrians don't come to town to help the Russians, and when they don't, the concert of Europe, the tag team that is Russia and Austria, that has been such an important part of European politics for the 19th century, that's over. So that means that from now on, countries, and we're specifically talking here about Germany and Italy, are going to be able to play other countries against each other. It means that Austria is going to be alone, really. You can go to war against the Austrians and not worry about Big Brother Russia coming in to help them out. It's also the end of any Russian idea of just sticking with the old schedule. The new czar of Russia, Alexander II, well understands that this is not the only time they'll go to war. There will be other con or contacts with the West, and when they fight them, they had better be better prepared. That means we're going to need to be more industrialized, and that means bigger changes that we'll talk about later on in this unit. As for the British, they're off to their splendid isolation to go manage 40% of the Earth's landmass. If you're Napoleon III, this is a little bit of a feather in the cap, a little salute to yourself. You managed to conquer the Russians, your Uncle Napoleon never did that. Well played, sir. Okay, moving down to the ideas of Darwin here. Now, Darwin, for us, is a scientist whose ideas are then going to be used in other areas because Darwin believes that all of human adaptation over time has really been geared towards survival, that it hasn't been about virtue. In other words, what matters isn't making the right decision. That is to say what's morally right or what might be phrased as the Christian right thing to do. What really matters is doing what keeps you alive. And that might bring in decisions that are amoral or immoral. It might mean that you are doing things that you shouldn't be doing in a sense. Okay? Darwin's ideas are going to be used by guys like Herbert Spencer to support social Darwinism. The idea that among human species, there are groups that are going to be more likely to succeed. Groups like Europeans, 
who have firepower and who have technological developments beside that are going to be able to assert their power over other people, Africans and Asians we mean, because they have adapted more adequately. Okay, next page, brief pause. All right. On this page, we meet two incredibly similar men, Cavour and Bismarck in Italy and in Germany, respectively, are both men who believe that planning is the key to success. When Cavour is going to put together an effort to bring about Italian unification, it's not the first time someone's tried, but this is the most logistically organized effort. Cavour understands that he's going to need a friend with some firepower. That's why in the Crimean War, we'll see Piedmont Sardinia, the country that Cavour is from, fighting on the side of the French and the British. So that years later, Cavour can turn around, call upon the French, Napoleon III, and say, hey, remember when we helped you out in the Crimean War? Time to do us a solid. And that solid is helping us in a war against Austria. Now, here's the bargain. Cavour tells the French that if they help them out, that the French will get some land and that the Piedmont Sardinian side will get some land. Austria will take a loss and there'll be a unified northern Italian state. And that's kind of how it plays out, except that the French leave the alliance early and leave Cavour with not the state he intended. He ends up with a lot of the northern Italian states joining onto his side by votes, but that's not really what he had in mind. And then all of a sudden you get this character who's Garibaldi, the romantic nationalist who crashes into the scene and Cavour has to figure out, what do I do with this guy? What's his thing? And Cavour decides, okay, I'll send him on this suicide mission to the southern portion of Italy when he gets there. Garibaldi is far more successful than anyone imagined. He unifies the southern part of Italy. Now, then Garibaldi gets a little bit edgy. He decides that he's going to push himself towards the Papal States, which are controlled by the French. And Cavour, who has thought this through, realizes if that happens, we're curtains. Because the French will come in, blow up anything that looks like a new unified Italy, see as it a threat to themselves, and that won't work. So Cavour convinces Garibaldi the layoff of the Papal States. Again, that's a very practical move. It's a very wise move. Cavour's logic is this is better than what we had. This is an Italy far more superior than what we had before. Let's just take that and let's take that as an achievement for the future. Maybe we'll get the two territories that we didn't get, Venetia in the north, still controlled by the Austrians, and the Papal States in the south, still controlled by the French. Maybe we'll get those at a later time, but for now we have an Italy. On the southern side of the page, we meet our man Bismarck. Now, Bismarck is a much more organized fellow. Bismarck is going to say to you, I believe that the only way we achieve things is through blood and iron. So Bismarck is going to stand out as someone who is willing to push the envelope, willing to confront. And through a series of wars, three of them, the first one, the Danish War, followed by the Austro-Prussian War, then the Franco-Prussian War, Bismarck is going to really rise this Prussian state into a German nation. Now, Prussia is one of the German states. There are dozens of other ones. What Bismarck has to do is by conquest and by politics, bring all of them together to make one unified German place. He realizes that he can't just do that though by politics. There has to be war. There has to be the defeat of the Austrian forces and the French forces. Those are the two sides that Bismarck believes I could have a problem with. If I don't do something about that, those are countries that might think, I wonder if we could take the Germans. No, you can't take us. We proved it earlier. We beat you. Take your place. That's where you belong. Okay. Now, I, I skipped over briefly there the Zollverein, which is a Prussian customs unit. And there's a whole set of questions on the test that ask you about this. So make sure you, you get this. This is an attempt by the Prussians to organize familiarity with the other German states. By dropping tariffs between themselves, it encourages trade between the Prussians and the other German states. That means that down the road, we might be able to call upon them to make a political union, like we will. But for right now, we're just making it an economic union. But that's a very important portion there. Flipping the page. Concessions given to the Hungarians by the Austrians, right? This is a time of practical politics. We've said that all the way through. The Hungarians are smart. They realized that Austria just took a big L in the Austro-Prussian War. And when they took that L, they're weak and they're vulnerable. This is the time to start 
rattling the cage for change. The Hungarians push for dual monarchy. In other words, you're going to change the name of the place to Austria-Hungary. You're going to give us the right to rule our land, our Hungarian land, by ourselves. Now, we're still part of your empire. We're still one country with one overall ruler, but we will be like you are, one of the minorities, Austria, but listed the same, Hungary, as part of the unified bloc. That's what you're going to give us. Like it or not, you either give us that or we will shake this country in half. Bismarck's attack on socialism in Germany. Now, Bismarck understands, staying with this practical run here, that the workers of Germany need to be satisfied. He is afraid that if they are not satisfied, that socialism will become more and more tempting to them. And so in order to satisfy them, Bismarck is going to push for workers' concessions. We're going to give accident insurance. We're going to make disability insurance take place. We're going to give working men the right to vote. All of those things to soften the sweetness, if you like, of socialism. I don't want my people going over to the socialist side. So Bismarck's attack on socialism is limiting their political actions, but also kind of buying off their ideals, saying to the workers, maybe you don't need 100% of what the socialists sell. What if I just give you 20% of it? And then you're happier. Would that be enough? And really, that is enough. Going on to the reforms of Tsar Alexander II, Alexander II, as we spoke about earlier, comes out of the Crimean War, realizes he's going to have to change things up in an incredible fashion, and does. He frees the serfs, which should create an environment of movement. People are now free agents to go and work as they please for whom they please. Unfortunately, the Russian serf is a long-time individual who knows this is what I do. I work on this piece of land. I don't know how to be a free agent, as you just called it, Holiday. So it's going to take some time for people to understand how that's supposed to work. He also creates village communes. He creates local governments. You know, you've got to take your hat off a bit to Alexander II. He realizes that Russia is behind. He does some reforming, but unfortunately, it's not going to look like a lot. The group that assassinates him would say, you did nothing. You did nothing to make us into a liberal Britain or France. Maybe that's too high of a bar to hold him to. But either way, Alexander pays for his lack of reform with his life. Last topic here, imperialism. Imperialism is the taking of territories, particularly Asia and Africa, at the end of the 19th century. We talked about economy being a, a reason for this because the European countries need somewhere to sell things and also want to get resources from Africa. We also talked about a big push here for nationalism. This is a way to hopefully really put the pride up for your nation to go and get as much territory as possible. Even if you're a small country like Belgium, you can claim an African empire that comes with pride. And social Darwinism is in there too. This notion that the European countries have a right to go and civilize these people to try and raise them up to a higher level of standard. In the doing of imperialism, we mentioned the importance of the machine gun. We also talked about the fact that quinine is there to try and help get rid or avoid, I beg your pardon, malaria and the steamboat. Now, all three of those are a testimony to industrialization. Look at Africa. Look at the countries that have a lot of land. It's France, Britain, Germany. It's the countries that are industrial. That's a big key. If you have industrial power, you get colonies. Think about Austria and Russia. Where are their colonies? Yeah, that's where they are. They're nowhere. On the other hand, the big European powers have a fleet of them. Okay, good luck. Study hard, people.